For most Nigerians, a good day is a profitable one. In the hope of a profitable day, they transact, they produce, they sell. The culture of business, trading and creating income seems to be inborn. So, this is a story that shows how and why. Why these businessmen and women have come to accept entrepreneurship as a way of life. How they have succeeded against all odds. It's a story of triumph and tenacity in the face of adversity. A story of the Nigerian spirit of resilience, joy and hope. A story about the same spirit that keeps them always open for business. From the busy streets of Lagos Island markets to the calm commerce of Calabar, Nigerians are trading for reasons as different and as varied as the countless goods and services they have on offer. For some people, it's just a means of livelihood and subsistence. When I can now further my education, so I decided to come and then work, to not be behind. I get through this time and that because I'm interested as I have not inherited it before. I don't need to go to my father to give him for the school fees or to feed me or to give me some money to buy the food. After seeking for a job for several years and there is no one anywhere, so I decided to join my dad in selling ladies shoes because that was what he was selling. Others are just in need to make money. I needed to raise capital and it's the surest and quickest way to raise money in the 90s. While others will see a gap in the market and try to fill that gap. We just wanted something fresh. There was nothing around that was really fresh at that point in time to drink. It was mostly all concentrated drinks. So we just started doing fresh squeezed juice. Most people want to buy very for, but they want to buy second hand because of the cost, the cost of the new one. I, I, I discovered that if the vehicle are made here, that the price will be normal like other one overseas. So that's why I think of green vehicle manufacturing. What I found was I used to have to go and search for accessories. I would go into the nooks and crannies of Lagos because I was looking for that particular piece. When I decided to do access with it, it's like, look, I like this thing, but there has to be a, a better way of getting it. Every entrepreneur starts somewhere and from all walks of life. I was born in Lagos, Nigeria. To be precise, I was born in Ikotun, very close to the synagogue church. Um, I've been in Nigeria all my life. I, uh, I, I tell people I was a lawyer. My father felt there must be a lawyer in this family. Period. That, that was what it was all about. <laughs> I was a pharmacist. My brother was a history major. Um, a fabric seller. I'm also a lawyer. I am I'm sure I'm the only person with a PhD that did it in Nigeria. I'm an architect by profession. And regardless of their background, every Nigerian gets a seat at the table of entrepreneurs. But how did they get there? Each one of them starting their businesses in different, unprecedented ways. <laughs> Business wasn't really started by me. It started by my, my, my dad. When I was a teenager, I found myself in India. So in, you know in India they do all these things. They do judges and rappers. So that was how I come into contact in the first place with George. So I like the business. So I got a shop where they're selling George. I started in a small shop where I pay 100000 
a year. So from that shop, I moved to another shop where I'm paying 500 and to this big shop now that is one million dollars. So I started bit by bit. This is the thing. There's this whole bridge about like silk, Irambuba, chiffon, Irambuba. Everybody was wearing it. I, I had like contracts. <laughs> so I just started from there. So I would go to the market, buy some. I bought some for myself, made them, took pictures, I put it on my Instagram page. And I asked people, oh, do you like this? What color would you like it in? And everybody was like, oh, we like this one, we like that one. I was like, okay, if you want it, I'm selling it. Contact me on so and so number. And then people said, sending me messages, oh, they would like to buy what I'm making. And then they paid money to me. I took the money, I went to the market, made it, and then delivered it to them. The whole group started in 1960. My, my grandfather came to this country, you know. I think he was trying to look for Brazil, but he, he stumbled around in the wrong country. But Nonetheless, he came here and he was a simple engineer, you know, he would, you know, get small machines, make his own machines and, you know, literally build his own rolling machine. And, you know, we were competing with the big boys, but we were taking our small little market and whatever we were making, we were doing it. My grandmother was the storekeeper of the factory. I mean, we were all living in Ikotun, you know, where back then it was just bush. As of today now, I mean, where the group is one of the biggest groups in steel fabrication and we have nine divisions of steel fabrication and it's all locally locally produced and manufactured and produced by, in Nigeria. In about 2007, I came back on my own to Nigeria to just kind of see what's going on. I had an internship out here. And we came out to Wilson Sarm to visit and see what was going on. At that point, we were doing ikro or what would you call it, palm kernel oil as a business. That's what we started doing. And um, we didn't understand the business practices. And so we were selling on credit, buying everything on cash. And before long, money done finish. We stumbled across this lemonade thing. It was really almost an accident. With 2,000 naira, we went to the market, we got a bag of oranges and a plastic juicer. We were doing fresh squeezed juice there at Covenant University in Canaan Land, as some people might know it. Uh, we rented a kiosk. One day we went to the market, we saw lemons, and we were like, ah, why don't we just add lemonade to what we're doing? Why don't we just add what we're lemonade. No one, no one's doing it here, why don't we do it? So we said, okay, let's just start doing lemonade. And from there, no one was asking for orange juice or smoothies anymore. My, the initial capital I used to start is very small. In fact, my first, I seek the, my first money I seek loan in the bank is about 3,000. 3, and I started from trading, from trading, I become an importer. From importing, I become an industrial. Mm. 20 years ago, when, when I was doing that Umbuka, I travel on Christmas Day. Because that's the day that, first of all, in those days, on Christmas Day, the planes are half empty. You get champagne free. That's when I was drinking. And then you are traveling and you are making money when people are spending. You are the only person that is buying out of ready. Their goods will be coming back when every other person is going to buy. So it happened by accident. And then I grabbed onto it. So you're always bringing in your goods when there is scarcity. One of my workers kept on trying to convince me to do aluminium. Comes to work every day and tells me he knows somebody that was making money in aluminium. And after a while, I said, why not? Then I did the trade one or two importations just to sell also as a trader. But I was rubbished with one, uh, by one man, you know, which I won't mention his name. He refused to, co to colgate my materials. And after a while, I asked how much is the uh, colgating line. And they told me, I ah, I can afford this. So I went and bought one. And from there, we now have 14 factories. We have two coating lines, etc., etc. And the man, to God be the glory, is now my customer, that same man. Sometimes I wonder whether he, he remembers. <laughs> now, with citizens starting businesses for various reasons, and each one starting differently, you notice changes in practice and choice of trade as you move from one part to another. Examples include saddle production and gold jewelry sales in the north and plastic and steel production in the south. 
different parts of the country are involved in businesses that have competitive advantage. That competitive advantage may be climatic, resulting in certain kinds of crops growing better there. Or it may be cultural. That means that over the years, they are used to certain crafts and certain ways of living, like the Edos and the Oka people and their ironmongery, or their bakliki and of other people that grow rice. Again, when you go to the north, for instance, you will see that dyeing and tannery businesses thrive there because of the historical and cultural leaning to animal husbandry. So I think it has a lot to do with competitive advantage and culture. Wherever you are coming, if you are going to house and you should know the kind of uh, business uh, activity you want to bring. Like, house and people are commercial, mostly. They do buy and sell, and then there are a lot of things, a lot of agri work. Then, like I said, uh, you're going to be their service people. So when you are bring, bringing services like telecom and so on, these kind of things, banking, it will be vibrant. Even though the, now that we say the world is a global village, but you know to the local people, what am I coming, where am I going to? If you are going to Igbo land, they are the trust, they, they want to create things, they are innovative, and they are hard-working people. So, wherever you are coming to in Nigeria for or with business, I believe that you will need to. In a very competitive business environment, the entrepreneurs that survive are the ones that find ways to distinguish themselves. One wonders how. I give my client the A to Z. That means a client will come to me and say, Phil, man, I need to get financing. I need to buy the truck. I need to buy the trailer. I say, gentlemen, you've come to the right spot. I'll either introduce them to Standard Bank. If their credit is right, they'll finance them. If they want a truck, I'll sell them a truck. I'll sell them the trailer and I put it all as a package. So a lot of my competitors, they're only selling one end product. What I'm trying to do with my clients, I'm trying to give them from the beginning to the end, so they don't need to go anywhere. They sit in my office, everybody comes to their table, supplies what they require, and move forward. We always think about how we can make it easy for customers to bank with us. How to make it easy for them to receive and make payments. How they can grow profitably. How to engage SMEs in a convenient and cost-effective way. That's why we have built a digital bank for them. Basically, when people think about fabric, they don't want to actually have to go through all that hassle of going to the market and then getting it sorted and being under the sun. Two, three, so there's kind of like a change in culture when it comes to that. So everybody now feels like, oh, okay, if this young person is selling it, then, you know, it must be really trendy and then I can, I can relate more to her and, you know, buy it and I can also advise them away from the typical like Iro and Boba where they can ask me, oh what do you think I can make with this fabric? Can you recommend a designer? All of that kind of stuff. Those are the added values I think. That's what I think I do differently. I'm in a plaza and it's right inside. I normally go outside. This is not my first shop. This is about the third shop I've had when I started. So I normally go outside to call my customers. At times they used to tease me, ah you're a madam, why are you standing outside? But you know one thing, if I sit in here, I can sit for days without selling. When they come, I actually remove money to make them friends so that when they go around, they can find that they buy the best price from me. If, it, if it's a material I'm selling 10,000, I can do away with 1,000 just to make you my friend. And I'll persuade you to cross-check in other shops. And when they go, I bet you they'll call me and tell me I'm the best. For me, asking less, I need to speak to the owner is higher max for any store because it means customer satisfaction and like I tell my staff whether it's six o'clock I come in here as a customer whether it's eight o'clock when you're about to close for me as a customer you are just opening your store it's morning for the customer and therefore the place should be as clean as it was in the morning the vision for the company so we put a lot of emphasis into training. We offer free training services to our SMEs, trying to improve their capacity so that they can run their businesses. I think this orientation is something we would like to drive down to the market, to let the market woman, the market man, the boy and the girl know that they are the integral part of this value chain, that without them, there'll be no sustainability in the economy. We're focused, first of all, on passion accessories. Um, I know 
through through this my journey, people would say to me, is that all you're selling? Fashion accessories, how much is it? Why don't you add on shoe and bag? Why don't you do clothes? And I say, no, I don't want to lose focus. Let everybody buy their clothes, their shoes, their bag, wherever they want to buy, and they know that there is a place where without fail, they can come to and get the accessories they need for those shoes and bag and stuff. Too many people that are not blessed to do multitask, want to multitask. So I'm just focused on what I do and I wake up in the morning doing it. Distinguishing oneself or standing out, however, is an effort that can be summed up in a few words. You don't see the wire there? The wahana is real. Doing business in Nigeria is an exercise of endurance. This stress presents itself in different ways. My target clients are, are very, very, they are, they are complex, you understand, group of people. They are not learned, they don't have formal education. Most of the services that we are providing are coming in new to them. And then their businesses are not formal, they do it anyhow. So you have to be patient to be able to guide them. Because sometimes the way they behave may discourage. Outside the shores or in a modest and lot environment, doing this business I'm doing, I'll, I'll, um, I'll do a lot of scoring, to give out credit, I'll do credit scores, I'll watch patterns, I'll segment people by age, by locality, demographic to work well, and I'll look at their financials, I'll look at their credit ratings and, and all sorts. And um, most of these things, I'll do it very quickly in front of my desk from uh, on the computer. But in Nigeria, I bootstrap. I'd have to look at the business turnover, the type of business the person does, what kind of, how, what, what's the velocity of the trade, how long has it been there. So I gather all this little information and build it up myself because they don't exist for me. Here is, you know, you're in the market trying to buy products. You come there, they don't know that I am a local, but they say, ah, well, you bought on land. So they'll give me a high price and then eventually you're literally bargaining for three, four hours, you know, until eventually the guy starts to realize, ah, I'm not going to get a, a, an extra dollar from this guy. Let me just come down to what he wants. I'll tell you my brother's story because he was the first one to move back. He moved back in 2009 for good. Me, I was still coming and going. So when he moved, it was like just landing here. Mom and dad didn't want us to come. So when you run out of money, there's no, hey, mom, dad. They were already like, why are you in Nigeria? We didn't, we didn't, no one asked you to come here. So it would be, the most difficult part was just the understanding, growing up with the culture, but then being here and understanding how things work. The odds seem to always be against them, yet they succeed. How do they do it? I think if you can work in Nigeria, everything else is easy. We take on a lot of things that to the average person, it's just like, how on earth do you people survive? I get asked that question, even outside of the country, that how do you Nigerians, how do you cope? Nigerians are strong, so I'm strong. Always there, you know, I mean, I'll cry for two days and come back. Is that Nigerian spirit in me, man? Like, no, this, this thing has to go on. Nothing can stop it. Mango still the struggle, so we are trying struggle to make sure say, we are not left behind, no matter the hardship and the that condition of the country. After all is said and done, their peculiarity extends into their business practices and leaves no doubt that trading is a Nigerian thing. We will not give up now because this where they born on they burn us into business, so we must not give up. And, and I know uh, Nigerians, we're, we're, we're very relational people. Um, um, no matter how we want to um, um, behave like the West, we like the handshake, we like the hug, and the process, doing the, the way we do our business, the bootstrapping, enables us to interface very well and feel the pulse and the pain of the business. I'm blessed, they are getting go-getters. Actually, abroad, 
I can tell you, Nigeria is immediately the way they behave. And I'm proud of being in Nigeria because of our diversity in tribes, in religion. As I am sitting here, I am a Muslim married to a Christian. I am from Kwara State, a Yoruba guy, married to an Edo woman, happily married with two kids. So, hardly all my experience in going abroad, I've never seen a country that is so diversified in tribes and religion like Nigeria. Yet we are still together. I want them to say the country now. I want them to say the country now. I want them to no matter where a Nigerian finds themselves, they always adapt. And there are very lot of people say that Nigerians are the happiest people in the world. And I think that's the truth. Like I said, I think it's that optimistic spirit. The average Nigerian always thinks that you go better, you know, and therefore tries to keep at it. In believing that somehow things are going to get better, even if it's staring at you in the face. So I think it's more of a case of mind over matter. I don't think it's, um, it has to do with expertise in business. But, you know, if you have loads of that can-do, can-do attitude, I think it does go a long way. And I think that's what, you know, we really don't lack in this country. In as much as we still live, we still live, we're alive, we have to find ways of unlocking certain opportunities. We are living, so despite the situation or the condition, you must have to live. So you have to think of, you know, uh, solutions on how to make a living or how to grow your, your businesses. So that's what Nigerians do, and which is the right thing to do. We don't lose hope. We have the resources, so all we need to do is to always think and re-strategize. When this happens, okay, then what next? There must always be a way. Nigerians do not hold back when they dream. They reach for great heights, drawing inspiration from their peers and those who came before them. Yes, there's a woman in Lagos I like so much. I want to be like that very woman. There are two. One is Flora Truwas in uh, Balogu 13, Bedfruit Street, Lagos. But now they are now in a, a trade fair. Uh, next person is uh, Biku. I like them. They don't sell fake, they make very good sales. So I like to be like them. I want to be like them. And then there's other guys like, you know, uh, Chairman Rabiu of Boa, like how he created such a conglomerate. And sometimes, they pave their own way to these heights, on their own terms. Business world, it is at least one of the major distributors of a particular brand. Like now, we're having several offices in different parts of Nigeria. We have a plaza coming up very soon. So these are the projects we are embarking upon. So in, less, in 10 years' time, or less than 10 years, we'll be the forefront people in sports and exercise equipment. 10 years from now, I want to expand across Nigeria, Africa, in physical locations. I mean, right now I'm online, so obviously I can reach, reach out to those people, but I want to pick up kind of points for the fabric so people can place orders online, but then they don't have to actually wait for me to move and ship it from here in Nigeria. So I can have pick up points in like maybe, you know, Ghana. Kinende shekara goma, kama mbren kama kamusali den. Da ina daga budaju troza. I will start manufacturing me too. Being the biggest retail outlet in this country. And in Africa? Hello Senka will be known in Africa. I have seen the sign. It's not only in Nigeria, but in Africa, Africa will know about the Nazi. I want to develop steel, have a steel mill, to eventually producing products for the country. And I want to give quality steel. Having done with access to die for it's running by itself and I still have so many ideas. 
so many things I've done today. So, um, yeah. From small scale to large industry, inshallah. Nigeria is several things to several people. For entrepreneurs, it is the home of opportunity. Opportunity to improve the lives of others through their business, to contribute to the economy, to make a profit before the sun goes down. All the while, scaling challenges as they come. Deciding not to quit. Deciding to soldier on, wearing resilience as an armor. This is the Nigerian entrepreneur. The Nigerian that is always open for business. I am always open for business. I'm always open for business. We are open for business. I'm always open for business. I'm always open for business. We're open for business. We're open for business. We are always open for business. We are always open for business. Always open for business. I am always open for business. I am always open, ready for business. Open for business.